this webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the wwwemerald borinfo website. These webinars are made available through a grant from the U.S. Forest Service. Thank you for attending today, everyone. And Tim, you may unmute your microphone and begin your presentation. Thanks, Robin. Uh, make sure you can hear me okay. And thank you yes, again sir. for uh, thank you again for welcoming me back. This is year. This is my third time um, presenting to EAB University on ticks, and and that's a good thing, and that's a horrible thing. The horrible thing is is we have so much more to discuss because Ohio really is on the front lines of tick expansion here in the United States, um, having gone from one medically important tick to humans, companion animals and livestock back when I was in private practice to five now. So let's get started. And uh, I like to get started when I do a tick program just with a couple of quick, fun, fast facts about ticks. And that is they are vectors, which means they transmit disease that can be bacterial, that can be viral, that can be protozoal disease, um, as well as they're implicated in allergic syndromes. And what we're finding and what I was referencing earlier is the, the research that is coming out about ticks, new ticks, invasive ticks, host range expansion, the diseases they carry, and the time needed to vector that disease is changing constantly. We are updating um, our research uh, nearly monthly. I update this presentation probably every month or two as I go forward. There's tons and tons of ticks out there. I'm going to be concentrating on the hard shell ticks, and I'm going to pick the five that we're going to be talking about today for Ohio that will have a lot of applicability for surrounding states as well. And then when I do this presentation, I commonly will misstate and say insecticide sometimes, but, uh, but ticks are not insects. They're actually more closely related to arachnids. And that's an important thing to note because that is part of how they hunt um, when they are questing, which is their hunting behavior, where basically they're holding onto vegetation with their back two pair of legs and their front two pair of legs are, are reaching and sensing for their prey as we walk by, because we are their prey. They eat us for food. That is a disturbing thing to me. Um, I don't like being at the bottom of the food chain. And unfortunately, when we talk about ticks, um, we are prey and they are predators. And so what I've been doing in the last couple of years is trying to dispel some of the myths that we have about ticks that are out there because we have a lot of myths. And uh, if you're like me, I grew up in the woods decades and decades ago and I got ticks on me, but I didn't really think much of them. They were gross and you'd yank them off and squish them, but I wasn't really worried about disease back then. And so we have to change the public perceptions through education so that we make sure that we're getting the word out on how ticks really can impact people's lives. So the myth number one that I talk about is how ticks are only active in summer. And actually, ticks can be active all 12 months out of the year. An interesting thing about ticks is they live a really long time. When we compare them to any number of the other critters that like to um, bite us or chew on us or vector disease in there, ticks live for years. In fact, most of the life cycles um, that, that we have for the common ticks are two or even a three-year life cycle. And while we'll have decreased activity in colder weather, generally there is a risk of activity uh, about any time of the year. And I know many, many cases of people being covered with ticks or tick transmission in what we would think would not be tick time. It would be in the winter. Myth number two is that ticks prefer the woods. And, you know, that is true for certain ticks because we do have some species of ticks that would be considered woods preferential. They like a little bit more shade. They like a little bit higher humidity, but we have a few different species of ticks that they're actually okay out there in a lawn or a pasture or a meadow. They can tolerate a little more heat. They can tolerate a little more sunshine. And then myth number three is, is sort of a myth and sort of not a myth. And what I mean by that is, the myth is it takes a day to transmit disease. And that was, that's a truism if we look at the CDC data that is related to black-legged or deer ticks 
transmission of Lyme disease from adult ticks. And then it is a 24 hour time window where the clock starts ticking, assuming that the tick is carrying the disease after attachment to the host, where it starts to increase your chances of having that disease vectored. And, and it's sort of linear. The longer it's on you, the greater the chance that you're going to have disease vectored to you. So we're starting to see, uh, unfortunately, hard evidence that disproves um, a lot of these myths. And, and one of the things that happened was here in Ohio, we had our very first case of Powassan virus detected in Ohio in Columbiana County, which is a county that is right hard up on the Ohio-Pennsylvania border. And, um, and I, I tell people, you know, to drive this point home, this article was published in the end of December, and our Ohio December this past year was a little bit warmer than normal, but it was still December, and so that is um, that is showing the risk that you can encounter a tick about any day of the year. Here is the life cycle of a deer tick, and as you can see, under ideal circumstances, this tick takes two years to complete its life cycle from an egg maturing through the larval stage, the nymphal stage, adult stage, laying eggs. And um, as I tell clients when I do this presentation, this can be extended. Ticks can go for a sizable amount of time without feeding if the conditions are not right for them to feed. And so um, this is why we have such problems with vectoring of diseases, because ticks can live a long time. And then the third myth that I like to address is disease transmission. And this is where we're seeing a lot of research that is coming out, both research in the laboratory and some real world data. But we do know about the 24 hours from the Lyme, according to the CDC, but we're starting to see some different uh, time periods. And really what it boils down to is we have to look at the variables different. We have to know that we were going to have different disease transmission times, not only according to what tick species it is, but even what life stage that tick is in as it's going through its maturation process. And then we also have to make sure that we know that um, you, you have different diseases that can reside in different places in the tick, which can impact how quickly they would be vectored to people. So I include this picture of the tick feeding mouth part, the hypostome here, and, and it is a multi-barbed uh, harpoon basically. And, and what that does is that assists the tick holding onto its prey after it starts feeding because a tick is going to swell up uh, multiple sizes larger as it feeds over the seven to, ten, seven to 10 day feeding period that would be common for an adult tick. Um, and then what they also do in order to make sure that they stay attached is they secrete kind of a cement that comes out there that keeps them attached. And then they secrete a topical anesthetic so you don't feel a harpoon getting stuck into you. And then they also secrete an anticoagulant because they're going to be feeding for a long time. And anyone that's spent any time in a hospital with a catheter knows that those catheters need flushed all the time. But we're seeing some worrisome data out there that, that shows that we should be really concentrating on not getting bit at all from ticks because potentially the clock can start ticking right away from attachment on there. Um, we're seeing that in the laboratory, nymphal deer ticks were transmit, could transmit Powassan virus to mice in as little as 15 minutes. And when we talk about how the tick needs to have the disease in it in order to vector it, we're starting to see some shocking numbers come out from the research about the prevalence of disease in ticks. There was a recent article that fell into my Google feed about a public park in Pennsylvania where they tested black-legged ticks, and they found that 75% of them in that park carried Powassan virus in there, and, and that's just a startling number to me. So the take-home point that I like to stress to clients when I do this presentation is you don't want to get bit at all for the rest of your life. And people look at me funny when I say that, but that's the goal because you really are taking a risk if you get bit, if there's a chance that that tick is carrying disease and, and the numbers that I'm seeing are pretty surprising in terms of percentages, um, then that's when the risk starts. So let's talk about ticks in Ohio. Um, and this can be applicable to a wider range um, than just Ohio in here. The ticks that I'm going to talk about are the American dog tick, black-legged tick, also known as the deer tick, lone star tick, Gulf Coast tick, and the Asian longhorn tick. And I love to show this picture, and I know whose uh, finger this is, and she's not a very large person. 
this is um, so these are these are not very large ticks. We have adult um, male and female lone stars over here. The middle two are adult American dog ticks, and then we have the deer tick, male and female, and they're relatively small compared to the other one. But I like to point out this guy on the far left, and that is a black-legged tick nymph. And you can see how tiny that is, but that tick has a potential risk for transmitting disease. And so, you know, when we talk about keeping ourselves protected, and I'm going to go over some strategies to keep you protected from ticks. We might feel these walking, we might see these walking on us when we're doing our tick checks. Really going to be hard to find this one and downright impossible to find it on um, your cattle or your Labradors. So um, that's something to keep in mind is that personal protective plan and we're going to go into that down the way. So the American dog tick's been around for a long, long time. This is something I fought in practice. This was a very common tick for me to encounter on dogs and cats. And um, this is one that when we kind of break it down a little bit, this is one that can tolerate more open habitat a little more read readily. This is a pasture one or a meadow one, or if you're out walking your hay fields. Um, the last two ticks that I got on me when I was just in a lawn were American dog ticks. Um, Ticks generally vector any number of diseases. They don't generally vector all of them. They all have their favorites. And this one's favorite would be Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So in past presentations, I used to show this graphic. I still show it. And I like to point out that you're going to see some, some serious um, similarities in this host range on the eastern half of the United States as we go through the majority of these tick species all the way through that. But I'm really kind of thinking, uh, rethinking this slide because um, in uh, the end of February, early March, I was presenting at the 10th International IPM Symposium, and in the tick track, I had a couple of uh, colleagues that were presenting, and one was a colleague for Colorado, and he does a large amount of citizen science tick submissions in order to get tick numbers to, to his laboratory, and he pointed out that we're starting to see ticks, American dog ticks, deer ticks that are cropping up in little spots outside of this host range. And if there's one thing that I've noted and if we've learned over time is ticks can adapt. They can adapt very well to live in places where they might not have lived before. Um, and they can quickly spread into places that they had not had any historical um, host range uh, space in. And so my worry would be is we're going to have to start moving the map on some of these. So the black-legged tick or the deer tick is one that is very common in Ohio now. This is the one that worries me the most right now, although I have another tick that's thinking about taking over the title. But this one transmits or vectors a lot of different diseases, a lot of devastating diseases. And here in Ohio, it was discovered in 2010 for the first time in Coshocton County, which is right here. Now, generally, the black-legged tick has moved from the east in a westward direction into Ohio from Pennsylvania over here. And you'll note that Coshocton's not on the Pennsylvania-Ohio border. And you'll note that the Ohio River is right here. Um, the river has never stopped ticks before, and I don't anticipate it's going to become a big barrier anytime going soon. But my guess would be it was present in some of the other counties as it moved its way into Coshocton, but that's the time that we know that we had it for sure in Ohio was at least 2010. And in fact, uh, research continues at the farm that this was found at. The farmers are um, good partners in research and, and students go back there and sample that farm all the time. But I wanted to kind of point that out a little bit because I'm going to refer back to this map here in a little bit. So here's our 2014 data, and, and this is a more woods preferential tick, as its name implies. The deer tick has a preferred adult host of the deer. Its favorite host when it is smaller is the white-footed mouse, which is a very common mammal here in Ohio and many other places. This is an absolute list of devastating diseases we have in here that we have um, both bacterial and viral disease, and we had it basically mostly in our wooded sort of Appalachian band that stretches from just south of Youngstown all the way around towards Cincinnati and Ohio, and that was 2014. And then in 2019, you can see that we have some similarities to the American dog pig host range, and it's moved out this way. But again, um, my colleague in Colorado said we're starting to get little bullet points where citizen science are turning in ticks and they're identified as black plague of ticks outside of that host range. That's not necessarily indicative of colonization and host range expansion, but that's worrisome and does indicate future research would be warranted. Now, 
we have a significant amount of, of Lyme disease here in Ohio. We have a significant amount in the United States. Um, at the Ohio Regional Tick Symposium, I listened to Kirby Stafford talk about cases, and the estimates are that we are underreporting by a factor of 10. So we might have 76,000 to 500,000 cases reported in, in 2021 last year, but the, the estimate is that we're closer to a half a million. And, and I, can, I can see that we're underreporting. And I, I point out this picture right here because this is reported cases of Lyme disease. And I like to point out the razor edge of the Pennsylvania and Ohio border right here where the cursor is. You can assume that the ticks are not walking up to the Ohio border and stopping. And so this probably has the entire upper um, northeastern part of Ohio should be just navy blue like the rest of Pennsylvania here. Um, it's, it's more of a reporting problem. We know we have Lyme in Ohio. We just don't know exactly how bad we have it. So the Lone Star Tick is one that I think has been in Ohio around as long as the deer tick, maybe not quite as long. Maybe that's a little bit after 2010, it migrated in. It came up more from the south. And the Lone Star Tick is one that um, I like to use when I use my education because the Lone Star Tick has a allergic syndrome associated with it that really gets people's attention. So if you are doing tick programs, um, or if you're say not doing tick programs, I highly recommend that you consider doing it because one, they're needed. Two, they are um, one that you, you can incorporate into multiple different audiences. And three, uh, I don't see this problem going away anytime soon. So if you are doing extension or outreach and you are looking to engage new audiences, um, tick programming is the way to do that. Uh, this is an older slide of the Lone Star Ticks host range. And basically I could have probably just grabbed the deer tick or the American dog tick and put that up there because it has expanded all the way Northern in the United States through um, the upper Midwest right there. But where I, attract attention and make sure that I have the attendees paying attention and participating is when I talk about the allergic syndrome associated with the Lone Star Tick. So the Lone Star Tick has some chemical similarities in its saliva to non-primate mammalian muscle and a human that would be unfortunately bitten by a Lone Star that might have a reaction to that can become allergic to non-primate mammalian muscle, meaning that they would then become allergic to beef, pork, lamb, or venison, which can seriously negatively impact uh, people's lifestyles. It would negatively impact mine because my very favorite food is a bacon cheeseburger and that would take it completely off the plate. And I'm not really sure I'm ready to transition to impossible burgers uh, right now if I don't absolutely have to. But I very commonly give this presentation to cattlemen's groups and, and, and other groups that way because in Ohio, the heaviest concentration of Lone Star ticks is gonna be in the woods. They're a woods preferential tick. They're a much more aggressive biter um, than a deer tick would be. They'll feed on any number of hosts, including people. And when we do tick drags down in Southern Ohio in this Appalachian band, we find lots of Lone Star ticks. In Ohio, that is also where we graze a lot of animals. And I go all over the state doing presentations and the number of cattlemen I know that are allergic to beef right now to me is surprising. And so um, that is one that, you know, when we think about ticks and we think about disease, adding an allergic syndrome in um, is something that really gets people's attention. And the worrisome thing I have about that is I've seen some, some anecdotal reports. I'm waiting on some hard and fast research and, and maybe it's out there. And if you know of it, please send it my way. But um, I'm seeing some suspicion that there are some other ticks that might actually be able to um, incite that allergic reaction than the Lone Star tick, where we're seeing signs of mammalian muscle allergy, also known as alpha-gal, in places where we don't have Lone Star ticks or, or even over in Europe. So those are the three ticks we've had for probably 10 years or so. And then in 2020, we identified established colonies of the Gulf Coast tick here in Ohio. Now that we knew they were coming, if you take a look at my 2019 um, presentation here on EAB, you'll note that we were waiting on this one to come up and I'll show you a map of its distribution. It's been kind of marching up the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys walking its way up towards Ohio. Uh, the Gulf Coast tick is originally from the Gulf, 
Gulf Coast and its habitat down there was a little bit more open, um, uh, grassy areas. This is one that can tolerate a little bit more heat, a little bit more sun. This is not an invasive, however. This is one that expanded its host range. This is one that uh, has been around in the United States for a long time, actually. In the 1800s, it was first identified. And this one is one that has a long history in the livestock industry. And when you look at this one, it's got a giant hypostome. This is even bigger than the one I showed you before. And so when this tick has feeding um, and it falls off after it's completed its feeding on its host, it can leave a very sizable wound, uh, almost like an ulcer, an eschar on there. And way back in the day, and this is the turn of the 1900 into the early 1920s or so, this was implicated in the spread of the screw worm in livestock because this large wound would be an ideal place for the blowfly that has the screw worm maggot to lead to lay its eggs in there. And then like most maggots, which feed on dead tissue, the screw worm actually feeds on live tissue. And so this, um, this maggot, this larval form, once it hatched would burrow down into the animal causing uh, a, you know extreme medical complications up to including mortality which led to uh, some serious economic complications and this is one that um, the government got together with a sterile fly release in order to get under control although we do see periodic outbreaks of this one um, along the border, uh, the North American or the, the US Mexico border, occasional outbreaks of this in Texas, there might be one ongoing now. Um, and then there was actually an outbreak in the Florida Keys of screw worm in 2017 or so. So we have this in Ohio now. And I'm going to show you a map here in a minute. It does vector some diseases. We worry about rickettsia parkeri, a spotted fever um, disease in people. It's got some canine ones. Lepto would be a tremendous concern. That's a zoonotic disease that can affect any number of different species. Um, when we look at the, the picture and uh, in yellow here, we can see the 2010 range and you can see the the Gulf Coast range, and then you see this expansion of its host range out here through Arkansas and Oklahoma. That was secondary to cattle shipments in the 1970s, showing this tick's ability to move into a new area and colonize a different range when it gets there, has food and finds habitat that it can modify its behavior to, um, to exist in. And then we do know that it is expanded past that point. So me with my mad PowerPoint skills, I added where I think it's range is now based on the reports that I read. And I do realize it looks like a turtle walking up the United States um, East Coast seaboard. But I've seen reports that it's all the way up to Maine. And this range expanded further up the Mississippi River Valley through the Ohio River Valley. And now the counties that we have established populations of the Gulf Coast tick are right around this corner here. And that is where Cincinnati is located just for um, your you're sort of being able to place where you're at in Ohio. We had at least three counties in this area with established host ranges as of 2020. And so that is one we need to keep monitoring going forward and, and see what impacts it's going to have on humans, companion animals, and livestock. And then this is one I've been talking about for the last several years, just waiting until it gets here. Uh, that is the Asian longhorn tick. Its history that many of you may be familiar with is first um, identified in a huge uh, uh, population explosion on a farm in New Jersey, and, um, and then subsequently has moved out of New Jersey and migrated uh, slowly eastward through any number of states until um, making its way over this way. And this is one that we have some significant worries about. So the working theories that I've seen is it was originally probably entered into the United States maybe 2010, 2013, but in sporadic cases where we really didn't see an explosion in population to where we had a serious problem, say, on a farm until that 2017 one. I have this picture here, and I use that to show that this is not one that has 
really big characteristic coloration like we see in the other ones that are here in Ohio. In fact, it, it is um, really kind of close to any number of wildlife ticks that we can find out there. And then this tick, the brown dog tick, which is um, not uncommonly found on companion animals. It can complete its whole entire life stage on the dog. And so this one was probably making its way in little tiny cases, but not really in an epidemic kind of a case because it just can evade detection by being nondescript. Um, my colleague, Risa Pesapain, that I do a bunch of projects with, first identified this one in Ohio on a rescue dog. And she was doing a re still doing a research project where when dogs are turned into humane organizations through the examination, if they discover ticks on them, they'll remove them, send them up to Risa, she tests them. And to her extreme credit, she picked a brown dog, a brown tick off of a dog. And instead of calling it a brown dog tick, she made the first identified Asian longhorn tick confirmation discovery in Ohio. That was in the summer of 2020. So that first tick was found here in Gallia County, which is down here on the border. And we knew that we had Asian longhorn ticks on the other side over here in West Virginia. And like I said before, the river never stopped a tick uh, in the past and, and we can be fairly certain it's not gonna start a tick in the future. And so then we go into 2020 and when, um, when I was talking to Reese, I mentioned that we had a research farm in the next door county right there in Jackson that we do a lot of uh, grazing, large and small ruminants. They are uh, an absolutely dynamite team to work with. The farm staff loves to work with researchers and they make our lives easier. And so they were going to be working animals uh, in the spring in May of 2021. And, and, and that was going to be an ideal time for examination of the animals, do some tick checks and see if we have any um, tick move Movement out of Gallia County, or if that was a one-off, um, we don't really know the provenance of the dog since it was a rescue dog. So we don't really know if there were ticks in Gallia County or if there was just that dog in Gallia County. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, one of the ticks that was removed from one of the animals during the tick checks when the herd was being worked through the chute did turn out to be an Asian longhorn tick. And so we did have that found here. And so that was last year in the summer, uh, or sorry, late spring of 2021. Then in the summer of 2021, we had, um, we had another uh, concern about that. And when we talk about concerns with this tick, we have several. What we need to find out is one, can this tick actually vector the diseases that we have present here in Ohio or in any part of the United States, because this takes not from here. We know that in its normal host range habitat uh, over in Asia, this can vector any number of devastating diseases. We did get confirmation that it can vector thyleria. That came in 2020. Thyleria is a protozoal parasite that causes thyloritis. Um, I've seen reports that it can vector, um, or at least it's able to carry within it, uh, anaplasma phagocytophilum, which is the anaplasma that affects human for anaplasmosis that was found in ticks in Pennsylvania, which means it'll be in Ohio shortly. Um, I've seen reports that it can vector, or it, sorry, that it can be able to um, to be competent for testing positive for Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the laboratory. So we still have a lot to learn about this tick. We're seeing some of the things that show that it can actually hold different diseases within itself. So those diseases can persist inside. We have to do a lot more research on finding out exactly what it can vector, uh, what it's competent uh, to do for that. And, and that way we can kind of figure out what species of concern we have depending on the diseases. And then we got to figure out what life stage um, is going to be best suited for doing these vectorings in the first place as well. Part of our worries about this tick. So right here, we have over in Jersey, the first one. And this is one that um, we're, we're thinking has some serious wildlife migrations. And you can see it sort of moved down the Appalachians. And we have the two places in Ohio where we know that it was, um, discovered in individual populations in 2020 and 2021. We have some outliers over here and that would be, my concern would be um, 
from livestock shipments, although I did see in one of our reports that the Asian longhorn tick was discovered on a Canada goose, and that would be a tremendous worry um, because this tick has a um, has a reproductive method that is going to make it a potential problem and that it can reproduce via parthenogenesis. So you really only need one female uh, to establish large numbers of ticks in any one given spot. In fact, we're seeing lots of clones and male Asian longhorn ticks are fairly rare. But we have one more county right here in Ohio that we got a um, call about, and that was an email that came to me last year in the summer from a colleague of mine who was a recently retired agriculture extension educator who's a cattleman, his across the street neighbor is a cattleman, and his across the street neighbor came over and um, told him that when he was doing a herd check that morning, he noticed three dead animals. And so um, my buddy emailed me and, and asked him to call him back so he could talk this over because when they went over to examine the animals, they noticed that they were absolutely covered in ticks, covered in ticks. Uh, to the point where they said that there were so many ticks on those animals that they could not even see down into the ear canals, which made me immediately think and worry about Asian longhorn ticks. Um, the uh, current extension educator in there went to the farm, they collected tick samples, sent them in to Risa. She diagnosed Asian longhorn ticks there on that farm. And so Risa with her students and USDA showed up to the farm in Tyvek to do a tick drag there to get an idea of what's going on at the farm. And this is the very first tick drag um, lint roller that they pulled off that. So if you're familiar with what a tick drag is, they take basically a one meter square piece of cloth and they drag it through that short period of pasture. Then you hold it up and you take a lint roller and you're trying to see if you can get lucky and pull a tick off there. And if you can look closely at that picture, you're going to see two adult Asian longhorn ticks and thousands of Asian longhorn tick nymphs. And so um, the estimates for that pasture is that pasture is contaminated in the millions there. And so that speaks to the reproductive capabilities of this tick. The questions are, many, uh, we have many, many questions, right? Why is it that this tick hyper proliferated in this pasture, but it didn't in the research farm? And at least part of what we can speculate is the research farm pasture was managed a different way. So last year in Ohio, we had pretty good rain, good rain for pasture growth. We had a decently wet spring, not too bad. And then we had some rain into summer. And what that means is pastures were able to grow and regrow faster after grazing. So this was a paddock that had not actually been grazed until the farmer put the animals out on that farm in late summer when I was contacted, probably around August, maybe even a little bit later. So this was hyper mature pasture, um, probably eyeball high to the cattle. And that is the ideal habitat for this tick to proliferate. And it, it basically allowed the ticks to move up and down a large amount of vegetation. It provided ideal habitat at the bottom, the humidity um, that this tick is going to need to survive and, um, and, to, and to breed into very, very large numbers. And so unfortunately, we had cattle deaths resulting from this tick. And, and we've seen that in the past. This tick has shown the ability to kill cattle um, in a relatively short period of time. What made this case striking was the three animals were not calves. Um, they were all full grown animals. In fact, one of them was their bull. And when they went back and they did the testing, the blood testing at this farm, um, they didn't find evidence of disease in the rest of the herd. So the concern would be that the um, animals died from blood loss anemia due to exsanguination. And this is really going to potentially be a game changer on how we graze animals um, in not only Ohio, but in our region, if this is a tick that can breed in this large of a, um, a number. And um, so so I've been working with other researchers and, and trying to come up with methods on how we could mitigate a, a worst case scenario like this in a pasture because you can't just simply tell a farmer to just mow it to the ground because then you've eliminated the food for the animals and you've turned it into a lawn. So we need to, we need to really come up with integrated pest management strategies to control this tick because we know that while you'll look at the literature and you won't find a fact sheet about anywhere that says that you would ever need to treat a pasture with an acaricide to control ticks, um, 
with this tick, it, it's probably something that you would you would need to do. So th there are models that are out there that compare what we have here in the United States and in North America to the host range that this tick is native to to find out where it's going to spread. And this is a screen capture from um, a, a overlap of three models from from nature and basically the lightest tan is where one model agrees and then the butterscotch color is where two agree and then the red is where all three of the models agreed on where we would have this tick move to and um, what is worrisome is all of the areas where this tick has been found in Ohio are in the two model agree and not all three models and so um, we, we probably already have to evaluate or reevaluate where this tick's going to go. So um, Reese and I just came out with a fact sheet that is on our Ohio line um, uh, fact sheet publication repository, Asian Longhorn Ticks in Ohio, where we do have some of the strategies recommended to mitigate this if you had contamination in a pasture, but you still want to be able to use that pasture to produce grass so that you can use it to raise animals on. Um, did some did some conversations with a researcher over in New Zealand. New Zealand's had this uh, tick for a hundred years and talking about how they go about mitigating this problem where they graze animals because they graze a tremendous number of animals over there. And like I said, it's going to take an integrated pest management strategy. There's going to have to be management intensive grazing. There's going to have to be um, tick drags to do scouting. Um, there's going to have to be animal checks on there. And even management of the forage is going to be very important in there because the, um, the, the worry with grazing is going to be putting animals into that tick habitat, but, but comparison of what this tick can tolerate in terms of it is humidity and temperature and time variables to what we can do when we create stored forages, including um, inside forages or, or dried forages stored as hay. While research is needed to confirm it, and this is hypothetical, hypothetically, well-made forage should become inhospitable to the Asian longhorn tick if that forage is made correctly and stored correctly. And that's important because you might be able to make a round bale or a square bale out of this and and they would they would die in the desiccation process over time as the haze dried down. But stored on the ground um, outside where it can get wet, you would have a microhabitat that would probably allow this tick to persist for a long number of time and mitigate the the you know the, the benefits you would have gotten. So by this time, when I give this presentation to most clients and, and crowds, they are crawling and um, and I've got everybody mildly terrified and I want to get everybody's attention when I do this presentation, because when I went through vet school, I was told that it takes at least three times of saying something before your clients will remember what you said. And I only get one try, so I need to make it impactful. But I always want to put there at the end on how we would keep our families and our animals safe. And so we start with the correct removal of a tick because there's incorrect removals. And I've heard them all. Trust me, I heard them all in practice. I had animals with with ticks killed by cigarettes put out on them. I had animals come in that were um, absolutely coated with diesel fuel. There's one great removal um, process for a tick, and that is using a tick tool or pointy tweezers to get all the way down to the tick's head. And then with firm but gentle straight upward pressure, you want to pull to get the entirety of the tick, including the cement plug that should come popping out. And a lot of people think they just rip a piece of skin off or something like that. But that's the cement plug that they glued themselves to you to keep feeding on there without falling off. Um, you don't want to just grab it by its butt and yank it off, or you don't want to put it, something burning out on it there or try to smother it with kerosene, um, that's not going to work. That might cause constriction of the abdominal muscles. You might actually make it worse by having the tick squirt a bunch of that gunk inside you and increase the chance of disease. Um, I've, I had, uh, you know, I was told a story recently that the foolproof method of taking a, a tick off was to heat a sewing needle up until it was red hot. And then you touch it to the tick's butt and that makes them let go. Um, and so when you are out and you're talking about ticks or you're removing them from yourselves or your animals or your families, or you're doing public health outreach, stress the correct removal of a tick because we would hate to make the problem worse by incorrect removal. And I've seen research where people have actually gotten tick vector disease simply because they took the tick off wrong um, and, and, they, and they made the problem worse as they were trying to make it better.
And then we talk about permethrin treated clothing as part of the armor that you would use to armor yourself up. I like light colors. I like long pants, long sleeves, um, permethrin treated. You can self-treat. You can purchase them. If you're going to self-treat, and this is something I stress to people um, as someone who does pesticide applicator training as well, you need to use a permethrin product that is labeled for use on fabrics. And, you, and the reason for that is, is there's a ton of permethrin products out there for about any different kind of applicability you can think of. So it is important that everybody reads, understands, and follows the label. And the, and the reason for that is the label is the law, federal law. Get permethrin products labeled for treatment with fabric. If you don't wanna do that, purchase them. Permethrin treated clothing is for sale at about any outfitter you can think of. Um, and as a, as a statement to its efficacy, the United States military has permethrin treated um, uniforms for a long, long time. Couple that with a repellent and there's lots out there. And I tell people do your research because there are lots of repellents. They have different applicability for different audiences. The label is going to tell you what you need to know about how long they're gonna last, how old you gotta to be to have permethrin on you, all of the variables you need to know about that. Um, and, then, and then make sure that you're adding a repellent to your permethrin treated clothing and, and to make sure that you're protecting yourself and being as tick safe as you can be. Uh, there is a new repellent that is um, coming out. The uh, FDA did approval for Nucatone, which is a essential oil um, that has, uh, is gonna bring another uh, sort of tool to our toolbox in the repellent game, which is welcome. And then I've seen uh, and, and heard about as I've done presentations with some other colleagues around the, the US about the, the vaccine or the monoclonal antibody treatments for Lyme. And I am uh, heartened by new products that are coming out. And this is a tool in the toolbox for folks, especially if you're in a Lyme endem endemic area, which is a lot of places, including a lot of Ohio, just note that you can get this vaccine and still have a bacon cheeseburger allergy because um, that's different ticks. And, and you wanna make sure that you understand that this would be part of your protective, um, uh, personal protective plan, but you would still need to do all the other stuff because there's, there's gonna be still a ton of stuff that you would be worried about out there. And then what I like to wrap up with, and I'm gonna wrap up here and, and anybody who has interest in doing any presentations like this, or, or they would like to um, you know, bring this kind of outreach to their clientele, they can reach out to me. But I stress the ticks are prevention diseases. You, you don't wanna get bit ever. If you can, anything that you can do to avoid tick bites for the rest of your life is going to be a beneficial thing because tick vector diseases are uniformly um, horrible and devastating and can affect the life uh, of you or a family member. Make sure that you dispel the myths if you're talking about it or realize the myths yourself. And we know that you can, and encounter a tick in any habitat, any time of the year. And like I said, you don't want them to bite you for not even for a second, because we don't know how long it would take for the allergic response after a tick bite. That might occur almost instantaneously. I know from, from back in my clinical practice days, immune systems are funny things. Make your personal plan for safety. That is going to include your permethrin treated clothes, your use of repellents, your tick checks, familiarize yourself with a proper removal method, and then realize that your companion animals can break biosecurity um, because pets and livestock are tick magnets and they don't self tick check. So you need to make sure that you're using good stuff. There is great stuff out there for companion animals. There's not so great stuff, mostly permethrin based products out there for livestock. Um, and then us as humans, we have little to nothing, quite honestly, other than permethrin that we have to self treat our clothes and repellents. And so Again, this is an integrated pest management strategy that you need to use to make sure you keep yourself safe. That is your clothing, that is your tick checks, that is proper removal, and more, most importantly, that is awareness. That is the knowledge of knowing how to keep this so that you can institute these things. And so that is coming to the end of my presentation, and I'm going to stop my share to bring up Robbins, but I see we got some Q&A and we got some chat. So feel free to dump any questions that you might have into Q&A and chat. I am going to jump into the chat to start first. 
I would love to have a reference for that Pennsylvania Park article, planning to share some of this information with my county. Um, okay, this is, so that article, I, I don't have a, the link to share right now, but it was Powassan virus. It was not old. You're going to be able to find it because it was in the last month or so. So if you Google Pennsylvania Park Powassan virus, percentage, you're going to be able to find that. If anybody has the ability to hit the internet up and would be able to drop that in the chat, that would be great. Uh, Kathleen asks, which county was the Asian longhorn tick found in? And so Robin, in Ohio, it's been found in three counties, Gallia, Jackson, and Monroe. If you would like to stay or become really, really informed, um, I am on a email working group to attend the one per month webinar that uh, goes out that upstate, uh, updates the Asian longhorn tick um, status of, of where it's found in, in every state um, all throughout the United States where um, it, we, we get that pertinent information once per month. The, uh, the, the person who I get my emails from is Denise Bonilla. If you want to uh, Google that to find Denise's um, contact information, and then you can get that update once per month as well. And so Kathleen, I, we ha I haven't found it in Lawrence for Asian longhorn tick, unless you're talking about a different one, because there was a, um, a hotspot on that map that was uh, close to that sort of Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio border. I know that 17 states have Asian longhorn tick in uh, up in my most recent update on the Asian longhorn tick working group was um, the 24th of March. And thank you, Robin. Thanks for emailing that out. And Bridget asked, where could you submit a tick for testing? So Bridget, there's a number of different places that are out there. And um, some of them are more or less open secondary to the impacts from COVID. Um, but I recommend tick report, uh, tick report, is one that I know that a colleague of mine just submitted and got a report back on. If you are Googling or you're checking out there trying to figure out where I can get my ticks submitted, I highly recommend that you just double check who is the host for the labs to make sure that it is a research university doing that. Um, and so Lori, yes, Heartland virus has been around for a little while and it is potentially fatal. The viral diseases that um, that that the ticks vector are are absolutely horrible. Powassan virus, which was just found in the United States, is a um, a neuro a neurologic virus that has a very high mortality rate, and if you recover from it, it still has a very high permanent neurologic damage rate, which drives home the whole we don't want to get bit ever because if Powassan virus can be vectored in as little as 15 minutes to mice, and that becomes you know, true or at least as close to true as we can get for people, um, then you really have very little time in your tick checks and everything to get those off if you um, get home and you start that process. And Mary asks, is there any effective biocontrol for ticks? So Mary, there was an entomophagus fungus that I had um, seen some information about that I, I don't know if it's available all the way yet, but it was a type of metarhizum that had um, some pretty good efficacy numbers when applied in the environment for tick control and was actually doing a pretty good job at um, minimizing any impacts on non-target um, uh, other in insects or arachnids that are out there. And so that is something we're waiting to see if, if that becomes widely available. I thought it was available, but I heard it might be pulled off there, so I don't have that on there. And David asked for um, blouse or trousers in addition to pesticide. David, could you could you clarify that a little bit more um, yeah, um, um, uh, in terms of what you're looking for out of your question? And let me jump in the Q&A. All right, Sarah asked the reference for the article. Was that, um, was hopefully the link that was shared in the live science was out there? Um, yes, I think Sarah ended up putting it in there for us. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, that was pretty devastating. 75% is pretty, uh, is pretty horrible. I have, um, I have seen uh, some data that hasn't been published yet, so I'm not going to go into much detail as to not take the shine off the researchers, but I'm seeing some pretty high numbers in lots of counties in Ohio, uh, driving home the point that you don't want to get ever. 
And Elizabeth, thank you for the kind words. Do I know if there's any work being done on a treatment for the allergy issue? I don't know. Um, the allergy, I do believe, has only been around since like 2014 or 2015. And if memory serves me correctly, it was identified when they were having serious problems with rejection issues for a pig valve in a cardiac surgery in a person. Um, and, and so that makes it a fairly new allergy. And we, we don't even know how long it will last. Hopefully someone is doing some research on it. I would honestly think that the, um, the beef, lamb, or pork councils would be funding that but um, that's just me. And so anonymous attendee asked, what are the symptoms of Lyme disease? Um, the symptoms of, of, of many of the tick vector diseases start with what's sort of the, with the, un, the ambiguous flu-like symptoms. And um, unfortunately, you know, if you go to the doctor and you're complaining of flu-like symptoms, the first test they're going to do is COVID and the second test they're going to do is flu. And so uh, if you suspect a tick vector disease, make sure that you are the advocate for yourself for that. Uh, Jennifer asks, is Nuka Shield available yet? If so, where? Um, I think it is. So, uh, but but I don't know exactly where it would be available right now. Um, and so that that is one that I would check around for suppliers in your area, or better yet, see if it's online. And I've seen some research that they're trying to turn that also into a project that um, would be available online. All right. And Robin, if you get a sec to clean up the q and I'm going to head back into the chat because we got a few in there too. Okay. Ah, got it, David. Okay. Military style of tucking pants and boots or use of straps. Yes, that is that is recommended. People will do that. You can do masking tape or duct tape around the edges. They also sell um, a, a form of gaiters that are a tick protective form of gaiters that you can pull on over your boots that reach up most of the way up to your calf that way so that you get all the nooks and crannies protected. That's a good idea. And then Marianne, I'm so sorry. Um, I Every time I do a presentation, I have someone in the audience relates some impact of uh, tick vector disease or vectored allergy in relation to how it has affected themselves or their family members. I have a member of my family that has had Lyme and one that has had Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, we really, uh, we really do have a, a serious increase, a slow, constant, probably going to get faster increase in tick vector disease um, that we're encountering. All right, thanks, Jacqueline, for putting that in there. Yep, duct tape your pant cuffs to your boots and keep the critters from crawling up in there. Ticks are gonna latch on through their questing and they're gonna crawl up to their preferred feeding sites um, and start to feed. And if you don't catch them before that feeding, um, that's when we have real big problems uh, potentially get started if that tick is carrying anything. Um, and if it isn't and it's a Lone Star tick, there can still be the allergy concerns. Great questions, gang, I appreciate those. I'm not seeing any more questions. Oh, we have one. Uh, David, have you heard of rubber boots reducing ticks crawling up? Um, I would imagine they might. The, the worry that I would have would be um, if you were going to use permethrin as a method of stopping ticks, the I don't feel like permethrin bonds very well to rubber. You might have to find a preparation of it that would be applicable for use on rubber, um, whereas I do know of preparations that will bond to fabric, including, you know, like leather boots or other things like that, but potentially could. Um, if you could find a preparation of some repellent that would keep them off rubber because they could conceivably crawl up a rubber boot. The thing that's driving them off boots is um, not necessarily texture, but the uh, applicability of a pesticide to it. Um, what should we do with a tick we find crawling on our clothing? I would um, remove it, squish it with something else instead of your fingers, and then I would wash your hands. If it's not attached, however, then it has not had a chance to, um, to, to vector disease to you. And what the recommendation is with your clothing after being outside would be to wash it and then dry it on high heat. And that way you're gonna make sure that you would uh, either remove through the washing process or desiccate through the drying process, any ticks that might've had um, yeah, basically uh, attached to you and are hitchhiking home. And Kathleen asked, do you want ticks submitted to the university? Um, if you 
when you get the Asian Longhorn Tick fact sheet, at the bottom of the second page, you're going to see uh, a link that you can submit ticks to the university. We are in the um, early stages of creating some uh, some Ohio State resources where we're going to really be able to do uh, some work in terms of tick data collection with subsequent extension outreach on that, um, that that I can't really share more detail on because we're in the early stages of that, but as soon as I know more, you will know more. Well, Tim, this has been quite informative and uh... You did a great job with the presentation and giving us a lot of things to think about and be afraid of, but, you know, as well as good, good suggestions and, and uh, lots of good information to go back and look, look to, to. and um, I wanted to uh, tell everyone that uh, tomorrow you will receive an email that gives you a lot of information about how to either contact him, how uh, a couple of the the uh, links that we've been talking to during the Q&A, and um, also a survey if you want to get CEUs for watching this live presentation. Um, since we, we don't have any more actual questions at this point, I think I'm gonna close this up and thank our presenter, Tim McDermott, for all his great information and taking the time to present it to us. And again, this, um, this is being recorded and will be able to view later on the emeraldashboard.info uh, website on the EAB University page. So once again, thanks so, so much, Tim. And um, I, uh, I'm going to be closing the webinar now. Thanks, Robin. Everybody stay tick safe out there. <laughs>